Hi, welcome back to Mrs. O'Gram's Maths. This video is going to take you through the external paper for level 3, 91586, uh, which is the probability distributions paper that was done in 2018. Now I'm going to attempt to do this in one go so we can just have one video with all of the solutions in it. That might mean that I might make a few mistakes on the way, so just bear with me and I'll correct them as we go. So diving into question one, we have the mean number of emails received per hour um, on one email account is 1.3. Now immediately I'm thinking that's a Poisson distribution because we're being told about a rate. Now I like to summarize what I'm looking at. So we're going to say X follows a Poisson distribution where lambda is 1.3 and that just helps me keep track of things. This first question says we are going to calculate an estimate for the probability that we receive either zero or one. So the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, that'll be 0 or 1. And we'll go over to our graphics calculator to do that. So I want the stats menu. And actually, I've just paused and reset my calculator, so you'll see what this would look like from um, the beginning of an exam. So if we go to our stats menu, we want the distribution, and we are going to do a Poisson. Now, I'm actually going to try and save myself a bit of time because I expect that I'll need a few things later on. So I'm going to put a 0 and a 1 into my list there. I might add some more later. In fact, I'll just do a few just since I'm here. I'm going to add my x values in there. And then I'm going to go to my PPD. And I'm going to leave that as a list this time. You might be used to switching to variable and doing these one at a time. I'm just going to tell the calculator that I'm doing it as a list. And all my x values are in list 1, where lambda is um, 1.3. And I want to save all of those results. So this line here, I'm going to save them into a list in my table. I want to save that into list 2. So just enter a 2 there. And then hit execute. So there's my list of all the Poisson variables for this distribution. Um, and they should get saved back into our table that is in the beginning. So here, now I can look anything up quickly that I want to do. Uh, I'm actually looking for a cumulative one. So I'm going to do the same thing. Distributions, Poisson, cumulative. But this time I'm going to save the results into list 3. So now I can look up anything that I want to back in my table. And not have to keep entering them. Okay, so I want the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. So that cumulative probabilities I saved in list 3. So we're over in the list 3 option and we want less than or equal to 1. So that equals 0 0.6268 and you should go to four decimal places when you're doing probabilities. We'll do a little check over at the mark scheme. We can see yes that was 0 0.628 and that was worth a U mark. Okay, part two. Using an appropriate probability distribution model, calculate an estimate for the probability the account receives at least two emails from 8 to 11. So we now have a new lambda of 3.9 because 8 to 11 is for three hours. Um, and we want to work out the probability that we get at least two. So x is greater than or equal to two. Remember, our calculator can only do cumulative up to and including a number. So we'll need to do one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to one, which is pretty handy because that's what we... Oh, no, wait, we didn't work that out in the first one because we had a different lambda. So we need to do one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to one when lambda is 3.9. So heading back over to the calculator, I'm going to leave those values for list two and three in there that were for the lambda is 1.3. Um, now I need to go again with my distributions and the Poisson. Um, we're looking for cumulative ones. And I'm going to say that all of the x values are in the uh, list 1 still. We, we'll still take all of those values from 0 up to 9. Um, but this time mu is 3.9, which was the 1.3 times 3, by the way. And now I'm going to save these answers into list 4. So away we go. And if we come back out to the table, I've now got the answers that I need in list 4 here. So I want the probability that x is less than or equal to 1. So here's the 1. Less than or equal to 1 on our new lambda is 0 0.0991. So this is 1 minus 0 0.0991. 
which will be 0.9009. And I've made an accuracy error here. So I just need to go back and show you something. It's actually good for you to see this too, that down here at the bottom of the table, it gives you the full answer. So if I move up and down on numbers, I can get the full answer on my graphics calculator down at the bottom. In the table, it got truncated. So I need to read the full answer from the bottom. So actually, this wasn't 0.991. It was 0 0.0992 because we had the 8 coming next. So if we take that away from 1, we get 0 0.9008. And a little check over on the mark scheme, we can see that that's what we were supposed to get, 0 0.9008. And that one... Um, oh, it looks like the marking for this um, depends on the next part as well. So we'll come back to the marking of the, these two parts. Okay, so back over to our questions. We've got to apply that distribution, at least one assumption needs to be made. Identify one such assumption that may be invalid, so something that might not be true, and discuss why this is the case. So for a Poisson distribution to be valid, it needs to follow that RIPS acronym, Random Independent Proportional Singly. So um, we can think of a reason why. We could probably actually think of a reason why it wouldn't fit each of those four. But um, we'll just take the first one. So um, the random thing is that emails being sent or received is probably not random. Um, you're probably more likely to get emails being sent at the beginning of day as people sit down to their computer and um, sort things out or maybe like just after lunchtime um, or at the end of the day where they're trying to send things off before going home um, and that kind of thing. So I've just written that up there or something along those lines and we'll take a little look at the mark scheme. So we've got a U mark being given for a correct probability calculated in part two or um, if you worked out, I don't know why you give lambdas 5.2 uh, but not important right now, or at least one assumption identified in context. You must talk about it being uh, what it is specific to the situation, not just say it's not random. Then merit is if you do the um, correct probability calculated and one assumption in context, and an excellence mark, correct probability, and at least one invalid assumption identified and discussed in context. So the difference between the R and the T mark there is that it got discussed. So you actually talk about um, it more than just identifying the assumption in context. Part B is about expected values. We're given a probability distribution of M, where M is the number of phones owned by one person. And then in the bottom of our box there, we've got the probabilities of somebody having that many mobile phones. We're told that the average cost is $130 each. Now I've gone over to my calculator and put those values in. If it helps while you're doing this, you can um, put uh, like titles in, in those tables if you want to help keep track of it. So we could say that in alpha, we uh, sorry, in list one, we've got alpha button there, and we'll just call that M. And then I'm going to go over here and say that we've got the probabilities there. So we can put, if it will let me do this, do an alpha P in there. So there's M and there's its probability. Okay, now we can use our, um, oops, we can use our tools to do this. Let me just get back to the right place. We want to do some calculations. We need to tell it the settings. So our, the things are in list one but the frequency is not one. The frequency is currently in list two, so we need to tell it that it's in list two here. And enter. So now we can go back out and do the calculation. So we are doing it on one variable, just M, and it's probabilities, that's not another variable, that's the probability of M. So it's a one variable option here, so for F1. And we can scroll down here and pick out what we need. So it's the this value here, the x bar, that is the expected value of x or the mean. So we've got 1.25. So that's on average we expect each person to have 1.25 phones. We want to know their cost. So 
On average, each mobile phone costs $130. So the expected cost of mobile phones owned by one person will be 1.25 times 130. $162.50. And we can see we've got that right. And actually that was worth a merit, which is pretty cool. I thought that was only going to be an achieve mark. But um, if you correctly calculate the expected value and then multiply it by the cost, that's going to give you an R mark towards merit. OK, back over to our question. Random variable N is the number of email accounts held by one person. And it's got a standard deviation of 1.4. That's how you read this. Show that N has a larger standard deviation than M and give one reason why this might be the case. So we need to go back and work out the standard deviation of M. Which, if you're doing it by hand, is going to look like this. But we can actually read it straight off of our graphics calculator. We've got all those values in there already. So it's right here at the sigma x. That means the standard deviation. So we've got 0.698212. So 0.698212 is bigger, oh, sorry, smaller than 1.4. Therefore, the standard deviation of n is bigger. And give a reason why that, why that might be the case. So why might the number of email accounts held by somebody vary more than the number of phones that they own? So I would think along the lines of, you know, email accounts are easy to come by. Um, they're usually free and you can make lots of them um, very easily. And we can certainly have more than three where M only went up to three. Uh, we wouldn't expect people to have lots more phones. Um, it's kind of standard for people to have one phone, maybe two for business purposes, um, but we'll put that into some kind of sentence. And if we go take a look at the mark scheme, something about them, um, the, the differences, any, any acceptable reason that accounts for greater variability of n is going to give you that mark, so it's quite an easy one. Um, so if you got the standard deviation right, you got the U mark and gave a reason why you thought it would be larger in the context of this problem, um, then you got the R mark for um, working towards merit. OK, let's take a look at part three. And this is asking us to take a look at um, whether M and N are independent. Support your answer with appropriate statistical statements and calculations. I'm going to draw your attention to the formula sheet for this one. So that's just here. We have on here this little section on the formula sheet that talks about um, how the expectation and variance of variables are related to each other. You've got this little bit here. If x and y are independent, then this um, set of things hold to be true. I'm going to look at the variance bit here because that's what we've been given information about, which is standard deviation is the square root of variance. Now, if they are independent, then the variance of two things added together will be the same as if we did the variance of one added to the variance of the other. We can ignore the A and the B, they're just constants, which we don't have in this question. Okay, so using that formula, if they're independent, the variance of M plus N will be equal to the variance of M plus the variance of N. So we just need to work out each of those parts. We get those variances by squaring each of the standard deviations, and now we will check. The variance of M is 0.4875. If we add it to 1.96, that does not add up to the 3.583. Therefore, M and N are not independent. So we'll take a look at the marking schedule, and there's all of those calculations that we were doing. You get the U mark for correctly turning um, a standard deviation into a variance, adding together the variances of M and N to compare them with the variance of M plus N, and then correctly explain why they are not independent.